We're going to pick it up at about verse 25. Actually, let's pick it up at verse 22. Jesus is born. Eight days later, he's been circumcised and officially named Jesus. And then it says, when the time of their purification according to the law of Moses had been completed, Joseph and Mary took him to Jerusalem to present him before the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice keeping with what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of doves or two young pigeons. By the way, if you were richer, you were to give more. You were to give lambs and things like that. The pair of doves is if you're the poorest of the poor. And that's what Joseph and Mary was at that point in time. Okay. Now, there was a man in Jerusalem named Simeon who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel and the Holy Spirit was upon him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what is custom uh, of the law what the custom of the law required. Simeon took him in his arms and praised God saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all people, a light of revelation to the Gentiles and for glory of your people Israel. The child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, this child is destined to cause the falling and the rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that it will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul too. Father, thank you so much for your holy work. And thank you so much for including this. There's so much we learn here. But especially we learn something of the power and the working of the Holy Spirit in the life of a believer. Father, I just pray that we would have a heart that Simeon has to listen and be yielded and to be directed by the Holy Spirit. For it's only then can our hearts and our voices and our eyes and our minds have the impact, Lord, that you intend for it to have. Jesus, we love you and we bless you. And Lord, I just pray that you bless this word to, to my brothers and sisters in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Turn around and say, Simeon should have been in the manger scene. Would you please? <coughs> So you and I are talking about the Holy Spirit's activity in the lives of those who had a part in the first Christmas and from their examples we are gleaning truths about the Spirit-filled life. How many of you have nativity scenes at home that you put out every year? You know many of us we, we have nativity scenes and for generations they've proved to be a good way for us to reflect on the Christian Christmas story to provide a good teaching tool for our kids and for our grandkids. Throughout my childhood, my mom would put our nativity scene right there on the coffee table in the middle of the living room. It would just be there. She'd take everything off. And um, back then, mom, uh, mom and dad, they drank and they smoked. And, but, but once the nativity scene came on, the, you couldn't have the ashtrays and, and, and you couldn't put the beer on, the, on there. It's the nativity scene. As I recall, one year, I, when I was a little guy, I thought that we should include one of my little green army men to be a part of the nativity scene for extra protection. And when I chose the one, I chose the little kneeling green one because he was kneeling and pointing his gun. And I thought that was just, yeah, that should be there and he's protecting baby Jesus, but my mom wasn't too impressed and um, 
His visit there at the nativity scene didn't last very long. It went by way of the ashtrays and the beer cans. Two who should have been included in our manger scenes, in our nativity scenes, but never got the nod were Simeon and Anna. They encountered the baby Jesus long before the wise men did. They did. And this morning what I want to do is I want to just look at the Holy Spirit's activity in Simeon and how it made a difference in his life and in the life of Mary and Joseph. Now, it's about 40, 41 days since Jesus was born. And in order to fulfill their duty to the law, his parents had to bring him to the temple to, to dedicate him to, the, to, to God because the Bible said in the law that the firstborn male child is to be dedicated to God. And, and it wasn't a big ceremony. It was just something that needed to be done. As a matter of fact, what, what would happen is when they would bring their baby to dedicate him to the Lord, they would just come to the entrance of the temple and a priest would be there. There's priests that attend all over the place. A priest would be there. They said, we are here to dedicate the baby to the Lord. And so the priest would take the baby in his arms and would just give a simple benediction over him. Father, I bless thee and thank thee, you know, that kind of thing. And unto thee, this child is now dedicated. May his life prosper for you. It's something of that nature. Amen. And give the baby back. The Holy Spirit had something way more in store for Jesus' dedication. Simeon really does serve as a pre-Pentecost example of what God has in mind for what the Spirit-filled life is to look like in all of the believers. Seriously. Let me show you what, what I mean. We're, we're just going to go through some of this and, and look at the activity, his activity and the activity of the Holy Spirit in his life. We begin with the first part of verse 25. Read it with me, would you please? Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout. Now this doesn't mean that he was perfect in any stretch of the imagination. But what this means, righteous and and devout. What this means is he, he was open to the ongoing sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit. Wait a minute, I only thought the Holy Spirit sanctified after Pentecost. No! No, read your Bible. He's very active through the whole Word of God, through history in God's people. Amen. Amen. And there is no way that you and I can be righteous, first of all, without putting our faith in Jesus. And second of all, without the Holy Spirit empowering it in our life. Amen? The Holy Spirit is called Holy Spirit because it both identifies his eternal character and it also identifies his primary work in the life of a believer. Now, if you think the primary work of the Holy Spirit in our life is to do miracles through us, you're wrong. That's one of the works, but his primary work is to sanctify us. Amen. Is to continue to move us, continue to bring us, continue to change us. Have you noticed that ever since you've become a Christian, you have become more and more sensitive to your failings and more and more sensitive to your sins. It's not like you know, your conviction seem, you're, you're, it seems to be more and more fine-tuned. Have you noticed that? That's the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit in you. Hallelujah. It's not a bad thing. It's a good thing. It's a good thing. It goes on in verse 25 and it says, look, look at the next thing. Just read it, for, read it to me, would you please? This is a fascinating phrase. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel. Now many take this phrase as a euphemism 
to mean the return or the coming of Messiah. But actually, the Greek word here for consolation, or if you have your King James, comfort, it's the word paraklesis. Does that sound familiar to you Bible students? Yeah. In John 14, 16, what did Jesus call the Holy Spirit? The paraclete. It's a derivative of paraclete, the same thing that, that the Holy Spirit is called. One who stands by our side. It's interesting because he, that also, you know, it's what's interesting. See that word waiting? When I read that word waiting, I think waiting around because he's not here yet. The word waiting in the Greek, it just blew my mind. Its main word means to admit entrance. It means to receive to oneself. It means to accept. And then it means to accept and anticipate also. But it mostly means to receive one to himself. What this means is, if, if, if he's waiting for the Holy Spirit, well, how would he even know there was a Holy Spirit to wait for and to open his life to? Because Joel made the prophecy hundreds of years before this, in the last days I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. And he would have also known where the word of God said in the Old Testament, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Wow. Wow. His heart, he had this anticipation. Now, by the way, think about it. Admit entrance, to receive to oneself, to accept. Shouldn't that be our posture when it comes to the working of the Holy Spirit in our life? Amen. And this is Simeon. And then it says, the last little thing that says in verse 25, fascinating. Read it with me. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. Every time we see that phrase, the Holy Spirit coming upon, was upon in both the Old Testament and New Testament. It has to do with the empowering of the Holy Spirit to work through a person's life in order to miraculously touch another. Jesus stood up in the synagogue and read from Isaiah, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me and he has anointed me to preach the good news to the poor, to open blind eyes, to set the captives free. Closing that scroll, Jesus says, today this is fulfilled in your hearing. The Holy Spirit is upon him. Now, we are spirit and dwelt to become what God wants us to be. The Spirit indwells us to make us the children of God. Jesus bled and died and rose again by the power of the Holy Spirit. We put our faith in Jesus Christ. When we do, the Holy Spirit rushes in, dwells in us, and we now become God's children. Amen? And by him, we cry out, Abba, Father. Being Spirit indwelt means you become what God wants you to become. Now, to be Spirit-filled means that we are enabled to receive in abundance all that God wants us to give us. Spirit and dwelt, becoming what God wants us to be. Spirit filled, receiving in abundance all that God wants to give us. When the Spirit comes upon us, it's when then the Holy Spirit moves on us with power to minister to other people. Amen. Amen. Spirit indwelled, spirit filled, spirit come on. That's why it says in Acts 1 8, and the Holy Spirit shall come upon you, and you will be my witnesses. And then you read the Acts in, in Acts, I think it's 10 or Acts 8, and the Holy Spirit had not yet come upon any of them. And we read that and we think, well, wait a minute, you know, then. How can the Holy Spirit not be in that? Well, they got saved. 
they're already, he's indwelled. But none of them had yet stepped out in his ministry power to touch others. That's why the bad Simon said, hey, we'll pay you money if you could give me that. You see? Yeah. So we need to be spirit indwelt, amen? We need to be spirit filled. And we need to be open for the Holy Spirit to come upon us so he can minister to us and through us, through us to others. So he goes on. So the Holy Spirit was upon Simeon. So here he is. He's in the temple. The Holy Spirit is upon Simeon. And look, read verse 26 with me, would you? It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Now by this, a lot of people take it to think that Simeon was, was old. But uh, I read some really interesting scholarly work this week about Simeon. And just because that's what it says doesn't mean he's old. It, that's just what the Holy Spirit said to him. As a matter of fact, Simeon's dad was Halil. And Halil was still around at this point in time. And they think that Simeon was about 32, 33 years old. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that interesting? But anyway, for Simeon to get this personal information, it had been revealed to him how? By the Holy Spirit. That meant Simeon had to be in tune with the Holy Spirit's voice in his life. Amen? Well, I didn't know the Holy Spirit speaks. Go through the book of Acts and, 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 and underline every time it says, and the Holy Spirit said, and the Holy Spirit said, and the Holy Spirit spoke. Of course he speaks. Of course he speaks. You see, the Holy Spirit speaks through, personally through our thoughts. In, in, in fact, this is what it means to have the mind of Christ. We know when the Holy Spirit is talking to us because he always conforms our thoughts. First of all, we start thinking in, 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 in conformity to the Word of God. He uses your own mind's voice. So if you're looking for a different voice popping in there, that, that's called schizophrenia. <laughs> but he uses our own mind's voice. He uses our own mind's language. He, he uses what's, what's available to him in the gray matter. Some, his language is a lot more, to me, it's pretty, you know, kindergartenish, Because that's all that's available to him. But how I know it's the Holy Spirit is because, first of all, my thoughts begin to be directed biblically. I, I think in line of the Bible. I think in line of thinking about, oh, I really like that, but I never want to like that more than loving my wife, my family, than loving my brothers and sisters, and especially than loving God, because that's idolatry. Well, where did that thought come from? It's the Holy Spirit's voice. He lined it up with truth of the word. So he conforms our thinking to the Bible. But then when he speaks, he also, because so, sometimes it's not biblical thinking we have. He'll talk, but it will always be confirmed by the Bible. So when the Holy Spirit speaks, he conforms our thoughts to the Bible. Or if their vo his voice is, is, Tim, I need you to go down the street right now. That is crazy. Is that you, Holy Spirit? And then automatically he'll confirm it. There'll be something in the Bible that, that, well, this person was prompted, this person, you know, that kind of thing. I'll say, okay, Holy Spirit, I'll do that. I'll do that. The point is, Simeon welcomed the Holy Spirit, the Bible says. Simeon had the Holy Spirit upon him. Simeon heard the Holy Spirit. And then there's one other thing. Look at the first part of verse 27. Read it with me, would you? Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple 
See what I mean about he is a pre-Pentecost example of what the spirit-filled life should look like? Welcoming the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit. Anticipating, wanting, having the Holy Spirit come upon him, hearing the Holy Spirit, then letting the Holy Spirit move him and lead him. See, Simeon was also acquainted with and submitted to the way the Holy Spirit leads. The Holy Spirit leads us um, by giving us, first of all, have you ever had a sense of being compelled? I just was compelled. I needed to do this. Something was compelling me. This is the, one of the ways the Holy Spirit leads us. Sometimes there's a sense of conviction. You know, I need to go and apologize to this person. I just got to go. Or I just need to go and pray for this person. And there's such a conviction. That's how the Holy Spirit leads us sometimes. Sometimes it's a burden. You know, I just couldn't get them off my heart. I just couldn't get them off. And I just had to pray it through. That's how the Holy Spirit leads. Sometimes it's a sense of urgency. Other times... We, he causes us to experience something of Christ's heart. All, this, all, all of a sudden, you just have compassion. This person did something really stupid, and, and they had every right for you to just give them a tongue lashing, but something welled up in you, and you just had compassion on them. That's the Holy Spirit leading you to deal with the issue in a different way. Amen? Amen. Now, he does this through instilling in us the thought or the idea that we just can't shake these things. I feel compelled that I just can't. It's just there. What's going on? And usually with me, they're kind of like, um, you, have you ever been in a parking lot and they have those little bumps? Speed bumps, they call it. I feel some the speed bump, <laughs> slow it down. And so I start feeling the Holy Spirit compel me. I feel the Holy Spirit lead me. There's a sense of conviction. There's a sense of sums up. And so what it does is I go bump, 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 and it gets my attention. I'm going, Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me? Where, where, am, where are we going, Holy Spirit? This is common to all Holy Spirit indwelt believers. This is how he leads us into all truth. So, saying all that, here he is welcoming the Holy Spirit. Here he is, the Holy Spirit's upon him. Here he is listening to the Holy Spirit. Here he is, led by the Holy Spirit. They're at the temple. And look at how he's enabled to do two things. First of all, the rest of 27 to 32, look, look what he says. It's not going to be on your screen, so you're going to have to open your Bibles. <laughs> It says, when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required. Remember, parents brought to the temple courts their baby. I'll have you know, Jesus wasn't the only baby brought to the temple courts that day. There were hundreds, hundreds that was always being brought. So with all these babies, and here's this priest, wah, wah, and this and that, and ah, ha, ha, and, oops, he peed on you, so sorry, you know, and you know, the whole thing. How would he know that this is God's Messiah? Is that fascinating? He took this baby in his arms. The baby had already had the priest pray over him and was blessed. And oh, he comes up. He takes this baby in his arms. And he prays God saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, now dismiss your servant peace. Well, see, he must be old. No, he's not. Just means that, you know, you can now... Let me live in the peace that you've given me. For my eyes have seen your salvation. Verse 30 is so important. Salvation wasn't the temple. Salvation wasn't the religious structure. 
God's salvation wasn't even the Torah as they thought it was. Salvation is a person and that was revealed to him by the Holy Spirit. Wow. Which you have prepared in the sight of all people a light of revelation for the Gentiles and for the glory of your people Israel. Something else that my research told me about Simeon they thought that he was a part of the Sanhedrin at that time. And if he was a part of the Sanhedrin, they would wear certain robes. So can you imagine you take your little baby Jesus and there's the priest and you do what you need to do. Get ready to travel six miles back to Bethlehem. And a member of the Sanhedrin comes up to you and says, may I hold this baby? And a member of the Sanhedrin says this about the child. That's why it says, verse 33, the child's mother, father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Why would that be any more different than marveling over what the, what the angel said to them? You know, what, 40 days before that or, or, or maybe three months to, to marry before that? Or what the shepherds said to them when they found the baby Jesus, who he saw the angels in the heavenly host and they said, glory to God in the highest. You know, it was confirmation, but what was marveling was this is a mover and a shaker in our whole government, and he is recognizing Messiah. Wow. But only the Holy Spirit can do that. Only the Holy Spirit can open a person's eyes to see what God sees. Amen. And then there's something else. He was enabled also by the Holy Spirit not only to see how God sees, but then he was enabled to speak prophetically. Verse 34, Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary his mother, This child is destined to cause the falling and the rising of many in Israel. That's prophetic and to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed. Think about the Gospels. Has that been happening? Did that happen? Think about now when you read the words of Jesus. Does it still happen? Amen. And a sword will pierce your own soul too. What? What? Well, when was Jesus' words ever piercing to Mary? Is there any indication? The Gospels give us, gives us one. There was a time in Jesus' ministry as it was going pretty big, but now there became a little bit of persecution against Jesus from the religious leaders. Jesus' mother and brothers came, and the Bible tells us in Mark 3.21, to take Jesus by force because they thought he was out of his mind. Remember? Mary with Jude and James. Jesus done gone crazy. And so they came to get him. Jesus spoke about some things and then to the little crowd he was speaking to, they said, your, Jesus, your mom and your brothers are here. And Jesus said, who is my mother and my brothers and my sisters? <coughs> Only he who does the will of God. You don't suppose Mary heard that, do you? You don't suppose James and Jude hears that, do you? Of course they do. Because we find Mary 
at the prayer meeting when getting ready for Pentecost. James and Jude becomes wonderful brothers in the Lord, becomes believers. It says in 1 Corinthians 15, Jesus in his resurrection appeared not only to the, to the 12, but then appeared to his mom and to the other Marys. And it says, and his brothers. Here's the point. Simeon allowed his life to be one of welcoming the Holy Spirit, to be one of, of yielded to the Holy Spirit, listening to the Holy Spirit, followed the Holy Spirit. And it did something for him. He was able to see Jesus the way God wanted him to see Jesus and speak about it. And he was also able to speak prophetically to Jesus' mom, which you don't think the Holy Spirit put that in her mind when she goes, what does he mean? And then Simeon. Wow, the Holy Spirit wants to use you and I too. And he wants to move in you and I's life. And he wants to do it. He wants us to be a big blessing at Christmas time. We get wrapped up in our traditions and dumb stuff. And that's good. There's nothing wrong with it. Listen, I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm a big fan of Christmas. But I want to be filled with the Holy Spirit so that in my celebrations with my family, I don't miss opportunities. I want to approach this season welcoming the Holy Spirit, yielding to the Holy Spirit, listening to the Holy Spirit, following the Holy Spirit's lead. Amen? Amen. How about you guys? Amen. All right. Let's pray. How do I do? You show us, Simeon, Lord, not to envy the guy and not to put him on a pedestal, but simply to use him as an illustration of what you want to do with us. Holy Spirit, I pray that we will take you and your presence, your voice, your leading seriously. That we'll have such a welcoming heart and a welcoming disposition towards you and your moving all the time. I know we blow it. I, I know, Holy Spirit, sometimes we grieve you. Um, and I'm so, I'm so glad that you embrace the cross of Christ for us as much as Father does and as much as Jesus does. I am so glad that in your very nature, Holy Spirit, there is forgiveness and love for us and joy and peace for us. Holy Spirit, forgive us for um, kind of making you the silent partner in this thing where all along you're the one who should be the leader in this thing of our lives. Would you, would you renew a sensitivity to your voice and your presence? I, I know we're not going to be perfect at following you or those things and sometimes there will be a, a swing and a miss. I, I know that. And you do too. But at least get us out there on the plate, Lord. Get us out there batting it. That's a lot better than sitting down not doing anything. I love you and thank you. Jesus, I want to thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit. Father, I want to thank you for the gift of Jesus. You're such a God of love. Just move, I pray, and bless our celebrations this week. Bless our family celebrations and our time when we come back together in church. 
let your anointing be upon us. Let your anointing be upon our, our, our brothers and sisters in the next service. Father, there's empty chairs here, and, and each one represents someone who needs to be saved, someone who needs to be delivered. Father God, I just pray. We pray together as a church, O Holy Spirit, that, that you will just help us be sensitive to you and how to reach out to them, Lord, and, and to love them. And, and when they just come in, Lord, to, for us to be so welcoming and loving and, and homey, that, that Lord, that, that, because it's always coming to a new place. It's so awkward. And, and help us to just diffuse all of that for them and help them feel at home in Jesus' name. Take a moment, would you please, and, and can you um, just stand and would you get in little groups, prayer groups, two or three people, and, and let's just pray for one another right now, shall we? And